who can tell us why we're here today? We're here to help each other do what? And, and, and again, I know that's like sometimes you guys might feel like to see life from God's perspective. But you guys actually do it with enthusiasm. I love the way Terry says it. Listen to this. Terry, what are you doing here today? Yes, that's it. You hear that enthusiasm and that purpose in life. That truly is our purpose, man. That's why God left us here from the time we're born again to the time he brings us home. We see life from God's perspective and it's a good perspective. In fact, somebody had a little meme I stole the other day and you ever see the glass half full and half empty thing? Well, I, I never thought of it this way, but they posted a meme. And they said it's always full. It's just half full of water and half full of air. So it's always full. And you see it from God's perspective, dude, it's always full. And we just got to appreciate it that way. But if we see life from God's perspective, then we can help others see it that way. And that's really what our purpose is. That's we're, our, we're already set. How many of y'all know you're going to heaven? You know that you're home? You know, dude, wouldn't that be awesome if that just happened this afternoon? <laughs> well, but uh Man, so we've got that all set, all ready to go. We know that's happening for us. So he left us here for others to help them see it that way. So let's pray and ask God to do that for us. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for um, really just making it possible for you to live inside of us. Father, it's awesome that we have the author of the Bible living inside of us. It's awesome that we have the creator of the universe living inside of us. It is awesome that we have almighty God living inside of us. Father, help us to really understand what that means, because I think so often, even I walk around thinking that I'm all alone, thinking that I, I've only, I'm limited to the resources I have, but I have almighty God who spoke the world into existence living inside of me. Father, thank you for making us, uh, giving us the desire and ability to be born again so that um, we could actually be on the clock for the greatest CEO that the world has ever known. We work for the greatest company the world's ever known, and we want other people to be a part of that company too. So Father, I pray that no matter what is going on in our life, whether we see it good, bad, and different from your perspective, and we would take it one step at a time, what do you want us to do now, God? And we we would just keep moving in that direction, following you and, and learning to see everything from your perspective so that on that journey, when we encounter others, we have nothing to offer them except your promises, the ones that you've given us, because there is nothing that will put courage in people like your promises, because you can't lie and you're awesome and your promises are awesome. So, Father, help us see it from your perspective Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know for sure when they die, they're going to heaven. They don't know if the rapture came, if they'd be left behind. They really just don't know. Father, um, I pray that you'd give them a desire today. They can't refuse to just surrender everything they know about themselves, everything they know about you. Father, just give them the courage to be able to just surrender it all to you and start that life with you on the rock, as we're going to talk about today, and uh, find the joy that's in there. So can't wait to see what you're going to do today. And uh, we love you, and Father, we want to meet you today. So uh, we're looking forward to worshiping you, and I pray for these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, you. you. All right, very good. JJ. All right, we'll do the uh, joy bucket time. So hopefully if any of you uh, this week felt your joy leaking, um, you'll help. Oh, we already got another I, I, I have a joy bucket, so as soon as we're ready for one, go ahead. All right. Anyways, if you felt your joy leaking this week, hopefully we get to help you fill it up, and you guys can encourage each other in that. And we've already got one ready to go, so go ahead. All right. Well, I was going to let Destiny do this, but uh, Destiny, do you want to share your joy bucket from this morning? Your meat in the freezer? You! All right. Yeah, so there's meat in the freezer, man, on, gov uh, on government land. If you ever get a buck on government land, dude, you know God brought that to you. <laughs> and, and he there ain't a, no two ways about it. And he it. had a permit for that buck on government, just so we're clear. Yeah. And he didn't it. get shot while hunting on government <laughs> land, right? So all of that is a wonderful miracle, and they got meat in their freezer, so praise God. <laughs> all right. Oh, that permit's important. You got to mention that. All right. Um, so we got one, uh, one written down uh, joy bucket uh, item. And so if anyone has anything that they'd like to share, I'll bring the mic to you so that those that are with us on Facebook can hear it. Uh, but for right now, um, we're going to keep this one anonymous. So someone has shared this. I've watched my husband submit to God's will and receive unexpected 
peace. He did what he did not want to do because he felt it was God's will. It was a complete surrender. Instead of increasing in anxiety and stress, it has brought peace. And this is undeniably God. So, woo! That's good stuff. All right. And then, uh, does uh, anybody else have anything they'd like to share? I can bring the mic to you so you can. Terry? Um. I haven't taken vacation once in the last five years, and I took one this week with my family, and it couldn't have been better. We went Aquatica, we went SeaWorld, the crowds weren't bad, the mask wasn't that bad because it wasn't too terribly hot, but it was just a blessed week with my family. That's right. Yeah, Keone, one of the first times Keone got really sick, it was... I tr contributed to SeaWorld because he went up to that fish tank as like a one-and-a-half-year-old and just went... <laughs> licked it, you know, so that's that. That'll do it. So your kids didn't, they didn't, Sophie, Salvage, they didn't, or you tried to keep them from licking the tank, right? Yeah, that salt's pretty tasty. All right, here we are. So we took a trip, a trip last week, and we met our cousins, and we had a whole week of fun. Awesome. As of today, I'm proud to announce we officially have four people in our family that can vote, and we're actually going to all do that uh, Tuesday together as a family for the sake of this country. Yeah. Sweet. Awesome. Oh, man, we're just going all around. Oh, my God, it's so good to be home. <laughs> oh, you guys got me going all over the place. Yeah, I uh, live in Indiana, but I had to come down south here to uh, uh, vote my morals. So I voted my morals, and I feel good about it. And I'm happy to be here at home in Driftwood, which I miss all you guys. Very good. Is there anyone else? I'm pretty quick. I can get the mic to you right away. No? All right. Well, um, we do have uh, one transition that we're going to do. So I'll let Pastor Eddie come up and share that beginning with you. Okay. So uh, if any of you have ever asked me about prayer, um, chances are I've told you about bananas. And uh, that's just something God gave me. Um, uh, there's a lot of different ways of saying it, but a lot of times you're like, man, I want to pray for this, and you know, how do I pray? How come God doesn't answer my prayers? How come God does do things different? And so what he showed me one time is that we pray for bananas. How many of y'all ever prayed for bananas? Bananas is anything, okay? How many of y'all ever prayed for bananas? Dude, I want bananas. And that's whatever you want. But sometimes, instead of giving you bananas, God gives you a banana tree. How many of you ever had to wait and nurture and cultivate that prayer request and wait for it to actually produce? You ever had that happen? That's when God gives you a banana tree. And then sometimes you pray for bananas. Now, how many of y'all ever had this happen where you prayed for bananas and instead God gave you a watermelon because he knew that was much better? OK, so that's it. You pray for bananas. Sometimes, man, boom, there's bananas. Sometimes the next day, bananas, sometimes a week later, bananas. But sometimes he gives you a banana tree and says, man, I want you to pray and pray and pray till I stop telling you to pray. And and eventually you're going to get bananas, but you got to cultivate the tree. And then sometimes he says, no, you really don't want bananas because you have an uh, al uh, allergy to potassium and you really just need a watermelon. And we're like, no, I want bananas. But then we see the wisdom God has in giving us that watermelon. And so that's a segue into uh, something that Emily has to share with us about Haiti that she just got back from Thursday. And by the way, thank you guys for praying for them. She, she doesn't belong to me, but God did put her in my responsibility, and I am so grateful that God bro brought her back, and grateful God brought Al back, all right? So, but both of them. Um, yeah, so Driftwood has been praying for a really long time uh, about how to get involved with missions. Sorry. Hi, online crowd. Um, so we've tried Nicaragua, we've tried the Bahamas, and the door that God has kept open is um, Haiti. So we finally been given bananas, praise God. Um, and he didn't give us just any bananas, he gave us the top banana. Um, so 
uh, Al and I saw God just do a lot of really awesome things this week. And so when we were going through all the stories, we were like, well, man, which one do we share? Um, and top banana was kind of the phrase of the week. So we figured there was none more fitting than, than the top banana story. Um, so many of you guys have probably heard Al talk about this guy named Tybee. Um, he's a 26-year-old guy who teaches English. Um, he does like parent-teacher conferences. They had a class election. Um, and this isn't like an official English course. This is just something he's doing because he wants to invest in the kids. Um, he's not getting paid for it. Um, he just does it because he loves them. Um, Tybee, for the last couple of weeks, has been um, walking miles to study under a park light um, for his national test because he doesn't have electricity at home. Um, so he's been doing all of that while still teaching the kids twice a week, and they're asking him. They want to see him every day. Um, so he's just kind of exhausted. Um, but when he got up there to teach, we got to go to one of these classes. Um, it was like there was another Tybee. He came to life. And um, the only explanation for that, I think, is that he was doing exactly what God has called and equipped him to do. Um, and it was so cool to watch. Um, so going back to the election... Um, he has a president, a vice president, secretary, treasurer. He told them, he was like, I'm just here to teach you. You guys are going to govern the class. Um, and so we've got the top banana, uh, which is the president. Um, and it was kind of funny. We got there, and we're like, all right, where's the, where's the cabinet? And none of them were anywhere to be found. And Al joked and was like, oh, they're probably just having a side meeting. Well, then a couple minutes later, they all walk up. They really were having a side meeting. <laughs> um, so this is the top banana. She's 13 years old. She's the president of the class. Um, and she's bright, beautiful, smart, um, yeah, just a really cool girl. Um, and then there's the vice president, uh, the little banana. <laughs> and then we've got the secretary, who is small potatoes. Um, and so these are the terms that Tybee gave them, and I think it's great. Um, but anyways, um, Al asked the top banana, if you had three wishes, what would they be for your class? The first one was... Um, she wanted to throw a class party, then she wanted to decorate for the party, and the third one, she wanted a shirt with her name and her title on it. <laughs> she was very confident. Um, but I say all of this to, to convey to you that like, when you think of Haiti, I don't want you to think of, oh, the poor, starving children. I want you to think of these kids who have bright futures but limited opportunities. Um, and like any plant, um, we have to water it and nourish it in order for it to bear fruit. Um, and so we do that while we're over there. We pour into them, but also um, we need to invest in the Tybees of the world because he's there when we're not um, still pouring into them, still nourishing them, um, encouraging them in the gospel while also um, teaching them English. Um, and so, yeah, I, next time you see a banana, I just ask that you would pray for the top bananas, little bananas, and small potatoes. Pray for the Tybees of the world. Um, but also pray for our church as we kind of develop the framework um, going forward in missions. So. Awesome. Thank you. And, um, yeah, Emily, uh, anyway, I just wanted to read this. I sent it out to a text um, to a group, but I just wanted to thank Pastor Eddie. Um, I know uh, just for allowing and trusting in us to visit Haiti. Um, it was an amazing trip. Um, where I got to see um, Emily's an amazing woman of God, seeking a life of service in, the, in uh, Father God's plan to seek, serve, and save. How much fun we had when uh, we were both challenged at times, and I got to see and walk alongside this amazing woman in new situations um, and rested not on our own abilities but on the Holy Spirit. It was uh, a very spirit-filled um, trip. Um, so we had fun, smiles, families, sickness, evil, healing, worship, dancing, great food, sweat, mud, children's hugs, loss, trading in the market. We'll come back to that one. Um, motor rides, um, more mud, lots of mud, plantation stevia, uh, tears, holy scripture of God, the village, the gardens, 
growth, love that conquers all for his glory, whatever it takes. Three main points that I took away from the trip is really helping the fatherless children see Father God's great love. And uh, Tybee and I share a common theme where, where we, we just, we'd never met our fathers um, until we met Father God. So um, anyway, uh, loving and walking, and uh, this became a theme for us as well, living and walking in total peace in the tension. Our great battle against evil and darkness with powerful, prayerful worship and embracing love. Too many God moments and sightings to mention. We'll tell you more about that. And just thank you for the love and the prayers that everyone here at Driftwood, um, they did love the buckets and the toothbrushes and everything as well. And i uh, see you on Sunday. Thank you so much. Um, so, and then, so with that, I actually am going to throw something at Ashley that I want her, oh, it's, you'll see, yeah, she has big eyes now, she's like, what? Um, but uh, what we will do is, uh, that's just one story, right, and, uh, and that's how it kind of goes, you get over there, and this is Driftwood's way of doing things, if you've been here for, you know, a couple months, you'll kind of find out if this is your first time, uh, you'll figure it out, if we don't scare you off, Eddie will tell you, welcome to the family, um, but we go and we meet needs as we have the ability through God. He just gives us this ability by meeting people, um, these assignments, these appointments. Uh, and even here, we have the same opportunities. If you're in a condo, if you're in a home, if you're in a special association or some sort of club, God is going to bring opportunities your way to be able to share life through his perspective and lead people to him, to the, to the cross and to the throne room of God. And you just have to be attentive to those things. And, um, and so one thing that I was able to be attentive to this week was, um, so Keone plays soccer. He does a little U6 soccer. And so if you've ever, like, watched um, cats or pigs or anything, like, try to herd them and make them play a sport, it's kind of the same concept. Um, there's one that's usually really good and, like, has been trained and understands how to do it. And then there's the rest of them. Uh, and so, uh, so there's that, and, and it's really fun to watch him. But then I also have a, another group that I coach, which is U15. So usually it's perfectly spaced out, and I can do it. Um, and I was uh, one of the games, one of the game nights at Fell, where the both games were happening at the same time, which is really hard uh, when you're trying to coach U6 and like not make them like push each other, kick each other, bite each other, hang on the goals, you know, grab the ball, run off the field, all that stuff. Um, and then you've got U15 kids that they're trying, they're still kind of okay. But, uh, the important thing about a coach is that the coach can look at the entire field, has the knowledge in his head about the sport, and can say, hey, just, I know you want to run towards that side, but if you hang back, you're going to have a really great opportunity come your way. Um, and so coaches have the ability to do that, which is what I do with my U15 kids. Well, we have game on the same night. And I thought, oh, this is going to be awful. Everything kind of worked out. But then I had an hour where normally I don't go home. And Ashley and I take two cars. So normally I don't go home for an hour. So I just kind of said to the kids, I was like, hey, if anyone wants to stay behind and play soccer, uh, we're just going to go kick, practice taking goals, whatever. Um, and two kids stayed behind that weren't on my team. They were on the other team that just beat us, but they were like, oh, we'll hang out. One of those kids is in the Bible study on Wednesday nights, uh, and then the other kid was just his friend, but he's the goalie, and so that was awesome because we actually had someone we could have try to stop our shots, and I spent an hour working with this kid on his shots and the goalie on the way he can do different saves, um, and afterwards, that next week, the mom comes up to me and just was like, oh, man, thank you so much for spending time with my son. And I was like, oh, man, I just wanted someone to shoot against things, you know, like, thanks for thanks for giving me your kid, you know, so I could take shots on him. And um, she's like, no, but he like really enjoyed it. And she said, and I'm a teacher at one of the local schools. And the boys that are in your Bible study are always walking around talking about Pastor JJ. And I'm like, OK. And then they're like, uh, but she's like, so I've always wondered who this Pastor JJ is. It's kind of cool to meet you. Can my son come to Bible study? Is it open to like anybody? I'm like, absolutely, it's open to anyone. So um, just so you guys know, like that's I just like to do like soccer's my thing. I just like to do it. I have a kid that can play and I don't mind volunteering an extra hour to do soccer with other older kids. And because of that, 
you have the ability, if you, whatever your thing is, you have the ability to reach into the lives. Well, on the Tuesday, that um, one of the game nights, that, that game night, um, Ashley had like this moment where she was driving in the car, and I want you to share that one. Do you know what I'm talking about Tuesday night? So share that. And so Ashley's going to share that um, right as the band is coming up. And I want you guys to hear this because as Emily, as much as you can go and you can do, when you're going and when you're doing, remember that prayer is extremely powerful and you need to be listening to the heart of God because uh, she's got a story about that. Yeah, so I've been really bummed because, um, not bummed that I'm having children, but bummed that I haven't been able to be on the, like, the, um, international missions in a long time. But God has just said, you know, like, right now you can pray. Like, that's what you can do. And that's more powerful, you know, than anything. Like, that's what I want you to do. And so Tuesday night, I was on my way, um, to soccer and the band can come up. So we're all ready. Um, <laughs> they're going to leave me alone. Um, but anyways, I was on my way to soccer and all of a sudden I just kept hearing darkness, darkness, darkness. And I was like, okay, like, what does this mean? And, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, I want you to pray for Alan Emily that, um, for God's protection, that he would keep the darkness away from them, that the darkness would flee, um, and that his light would be present. And anyway, so I had text Emily and I said, Hey, like, you know, God told me to pray about darkness, like what was going on last night. And um, you can kind of say what happened. Yeah. So. Earlier that day, um, a guy had walked onto the where we stay at the mission. Um, and he was some sort of like, I don't know, he was involved in voodoo. Um, and Al had the chance to, to pray with him. And then later that day, as we were walking, um, we w walked past some people um, engaged in satanic worship uh they were worshiping the devil um and so that was just a very timely prayer yeah so it's just really cool how like even if you can't go on the field like if you're here um you can be a prayer partner a prayer warrior and um, be praying for those people on the field and so that was just one cool instance of how um god can even use you here um for his glory so we're gonna stand and let's worship together this morning So precious is the
Lord, this morning where I was reading in Deuteronomy, it said that your name is glorious and awesome. Um, I praise you for that because it's true. Um, I thank you that you're worthy of worship um, because you stand by our side. You protect us day to day. Um, but Lord, you stood in our place. Um, you provided the ultimate sacrifice, dying for our sins. Um, you died for those people that were worshiping a name other than yours on the side of the street, Lord. Um, but you died for each person in this room. And so, um, God, if there's someone who hasn't accepted that, who doesn't know that, um, Lord, show them. Show them how much you love them, uh, that you would make that sacrifice. But, Lord, show them that you're worthy of giving up sin. You're worthy of giving up anything that the world has to offer because none of it comes close to the glory that you have, God. Um, I just thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done. Lord, help us to just stand in awe of you. Help us to worship you. Help us to focus on you and you alone uh, during this time of worship. Pray that you would speak through Pastor Eddie, Lord. Um, take away any of his own thoughts. Take away any distractions. But, Lord, help him to just preach your word. Um, preach what you've put on his heart for this congregation, God. Um, and help us to take it and apply it. I ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, amen. Grab a seat if you're a kid heading out to uh, Kidland. Who's got the kids today? Destiny? Uh, oh, oh, Nate. Oh, we got the, the crew, Bruce Lee and Nate. And, all right. And Emma, awesome. By the way, uh, I thought JJ was going to share a couple Wednesdays ago. Um, I think it was a couple Wednesdays ago or last Wednesday. It all kind of runs together. But in the youth group, uh, Nate uh, and JJ have the guys. When was it that Jake gave his life to Christ? This past Wednesday, man. Yeah, dude. This past Wednesday, one of the kids, man. Uh, it, it's a killer story that uh, you can ask him about. But one of the little surfer guys that just placed in one of the contests, all this. There's a whole bunch of them. But uh, Jake, that, that's Francine's son. Uh, Francine and Howie, you know them? But Francine's son gave his life to Christ Wednesday, dude. That was awesome. <laughs> so that little neighborhood is being reached for Christ. And uh, it's pretty cool what God's doing in all of that. So, uh, hey, so um, anyways, uh, I didn't get to go to this trip uh, to Haiti, and it was Pittsburgh, Rob. What's up, brother? You, yeah, this is like all home week. I could go through and see Judy and Charlie. Oh, my goodness, Judy. Uh, uh, Simmons, and uh, yeah, and uh, man, we went to the Bahamas together. Pittsburgh, Rob, and I, we've been all over together, all, all, all cheese balling, right, brother? Man, I'm looking at all kinds of people just kind of, it's like all old home week here all the time. And seriously, if you uh, if we don't scare you off, welcome to the family. We really want you to be part of it. We love you and we do stuff together. If you are looking for a church where you can hide and not be known and just kind of, you know, do your own thing in the back. This is not the place because, <laughs> dude, if you haven't figured it out, dude, you're here with, <laughs> without Jimmy. That is awesome. And uh, man, so so, yeah, you were trying to just hide for it. Like, oh, no, he's going to call me out. My family said they look, look at my eyes to see where I scan the crowd that who I'm going to pick on next or whatever. It's because I love you, man. And we are family together. And it's awesome having you guys. And, um, you know, uh, Rick, when I see people look down like that, that is just my clue that they are like, yeah, I really want him to pick on me and call on me. But so anyways, I love you guys. And, and you guys are back from Michigan. And yeah, back home. It's and, and it's just awesome to have everybody here, man. I, I love you guys, but not as much as Jesus can love you. And uh, so I hope you get that message today. Hey, so I didn't get to go to Haiti this time. And it was really hard because I've never passed up a trip to Haiti because if Haiti is nothing else, it is an awesome meal. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and it's what, much more than that. I have a relationship with the cooks that Al, Al doesn't even eat, all right? And Emily has limited stuff that she eats, you know, and so it's like the cooks probably saw these two skinny people get off the, off the truck and they're like, oh, where's Pastor Eddie? You know, because, dude, I will eat stuff off your plate that you don't want to eat just so that we don't hurt anybody's feelings, but it's not hurting mine because I'm digging it. But there's no way I miss a trip to Haiti. Um, I love going to Haiti, and, and it is more than the food. As again, I really do have a relationship with the cooks. We have built this bond and with other people that are this family. And, but I wasn't supposed to go this time. 
And uh, I prayed hard and kept asking God, you know, why am I supposed to go? And he doesn't always tell you. And I just know I wasn't supposed to go. The trip was paid for. I could have gone. It was in the budget that we have for it. And it was like, but I'm not supposed to go. And so I was kind of reminiscing some different things. And um, I know they were there to actually kind of scout things out. We really did send them as guinea pigs to find out if it was actually safe or not to go there. All right. That was really the purpose for that trip, uh, you know, so that we can now start maybe putting some teams together and you can meet all these awesome folks that we keep telling you about because we have family there. And once you go, the purpose for you going is so you figure out what you're going to do on the next trip and the next trip and next year because it's family. And the most valuable thing you have to offer anyone over there is the same valuable thing they have to offer you. And that's yourself. Isn't that right, Al? Man, it isn't about bringing stuff here. It's about falling in love with each other, believers, and encouraging them. But uh, they were exploring some different routes. They were going to fly in this time to Peon because of inflation and things costing twice as much. We need to shorten maybe the transportation costs. So they, you know, it, 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 there, there, we heard there was a route that was a little shorter, a little quicker, maybe a little less expensive on the Haitian end. You know, also uh, cutting the trip in half as far as from the airport to the compound. Uh, it might be safer if there are riots or different things going on. And so the idea was they were going to go a different route, but there's a route I love going on. And I want to tell you about that real quick, man. I love flying in with Missionary Flights International, flying into Cap Icia, or as you white people would say, Cap, Cap Haitian. All right, you non-Haitian people would say that, right? So Cap Haitian, we fly into Cap Icia, and we go into that airport, and there's a big city, and then we kind of wait, get through customs, all this, and then all of a sudden, I, I, get, in my, I get in the truck, and me, I like riding in the back of the truck, right? Son, son, did you ride in the back of the truck with me, or did you ride inside when you went? Oh, you were in the back? Okay, yeah. Oh, where J.J. did what? Uh, <laughs> J.J. has motion sickness. We'll just say that. If you ever go on a trip with J.J., make sure that he's not near you, okay? Even if, even if all he eats is a cracker, that's all we're saying. But, uh, yeah, it, it just never fails. Uh, I made the mistake on the first trip with J.J. feeding him a public sub. <laughs> <laughs> all right we'll leave it at that i have never seen i you know the little bags in the back of the seat on the airport i make hand puppets out of those and i'll be like you know i make puppet jj actually used it i never saw anybody use them before but all right enough of that you had to bring that up didn't you but but anyways on the back of the uh, i ride in the back of the truck i hold on to the roll cage and for the three hour trip from cap haitian all the way or cap Isia, all the way into debache I, I just love looking at the countryside. I love looking at the people. I am not an American by the time three hours is up and I've ridden in the back of the truck and I'm bouncing around and I get there. I am now a Haitian. Mm, say, I see ya. That's me. I see them, they're like, oh, bonjour, bonjour. And I say, mm, see, I see ya. And they're like, oh, we'll see, I see ya. You're a Haitian. That's it. Because, man, it's awesome. It's my acclamation. But here's how it starts. As soon as you get on this kind of modern highway, modern highway um, now the roadside attractions are a little bit different than you would see on a highway in america um, but the highway's good and and you get going and you're back there and all of a sudden you look to the south and you see this rock giant mountain range it looks impenetrable it looks like you there's no way as high as you can look it's up there as wide as you look it's just this giant rock wall and I'll never forget the first time I went, man, I'm looking at this giant rock wall thing and there's no way we're getting past that. Even in my mind, I'm like thinking, well, if you can't get this rock, it, it's in the, it's in the way. Everybody say it's in the way. <laughs> okay. Cause that's what we're going to learn about today. This rock, uh, it looks like it's in the way. So if you think this rock is in the way, you got some options. I'm thinking, dude, it's in the way. So we're just going to have to stop and not achieve what we had planned to achieve for not even accomplish the purpose for which we went we're just gonna have to stop this rocks in the way i can't get past this rock and um jj is this thing it, it keeps yanking off me all right, all right so I, I get going and there's just I, I, we gotta stop there's a rock in the way so we're gonna go back and just do whatever we're not gonna get to accomplish what we really thought we were gonna accomplish oh wait there's another option if the rock's in the way you know what i could do i could go around the rock and I could go around the rock, but later I looked at the geographical region, and you know what? To get where we need to go, we can't go around the rock, because we go around the rock. I get all the way to the south side. Guess what? 
there's more rock. In fact, it, I would be going all the way around the rock. I'd be going in circles if I tried to get around the rock. The only way to get where we needed to go was to get where? On the rock. And, and in fact, so I kept thinking the rock is in the way, but then it dawned on me. Instead of it being in the way, the rock is the way. Instead of the rock being in the way, every time I say the rock's in the way, you guys say it is the way. You ready? Instead of it being in the way, it is the way. Inst one more time. Come on, man. Just because I like, oh, I love when you all participate and I don't have to call on you, man. Inst uh, instead of it being in the way, it is the way. The way. Yeah. The rock is the way. And so, you know what? As we started going down and all of a sudden we started hitting these different switchbacks and man, we start going up this mountain. I couldn't see any roads until we actually got there. Right, Santa? Man, you see and you get up there and all of a sudden, like in the rainy season, you know what I saw in that? I saw some of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life. I started seeing these beautiful little waterfalls coming out of these little tropical, you know, mountains covered with vegetation. It was gorgeous. I've looked down into a ravine and, and there it was. There were just hundreds of people doing life in the river, people washing their clothes, people kind of hanging out, people enjoying life. I mean, even though they had the most simplest things, they don't they, you know what they don't have. They don't have the complicated lives we have. That's one of the reasons I hate coming back sometimes. I'm going, oh, tomorrow I got to go back to that complicated life I created in America for myself. You know, when you're there, it's just so simplistic. People just hang out on the front porch. I'm looking like, how do they have time to hang out on the front porch and just talk with the neighbors? Well, they didn't create that. You see that simplicity. Man, you see mixed match clothes. How many of y'all have somebody in your house that you always have to correct what they're going to wear before you let them out in public? Because it doesn't match, right? Well, there, nobody's clothes matches. But yet you look at it, and it's just a beautiful mosaic of colors that are like, wow, why don't we do that? And then you get going a little further, and then you'll see 20, 30, 40 school kids all with looking like bananas. They'll have yellow pants and yellow shirts. And then you go to the next village, and they've got blue pants and blue shirts. Go to the next one, they got green pants. And I'm talking mint green, like Girl Scout cookies. Man, uh, pan, and it's like just color everywhere. You go by fruit stands, and there's fruit that's just organic and full of color. It's just beautiful. You see people with smiles, man. You see people kind of just relaxed, enjoying themselves, and it's a beautiful thing. And so... Man, once you get up in that mountain and you realize it's not in the way, it is the way, you get up on that mountain and you experience some of the most beautiful things you could ever experience. And then one of my favorite things that we get to experience, about halfway up there, in there, all of a sudden you pull into a village and on the side of the mountain, it's like a Hollywood looking sign, but it's dark. They have written with big, giant white letters there. It's D-O-N-D-O-N. -D -O -N. Looks like Hollywood sign. Don Don. And I know as soon as we pull into Don Don, we'll stop the truck. And, and what happens, Emily, as soon as you stop the truck in Don Don? Oh, we get bananas. Yeah, among other things. Dude, in Don Don, all of a sudden, man, dozens of people will come out of the woodwork with all kinds of colorful, beautiful, organic fruit on their heads. You're looking down, and there's a lady with, like, 12 avocados and she only wants a couple of bucks for these and they're the most buttery avocados you've ever had there's mangoes there's oranges and bananas and somebody have a big bunch of bananas and want a couple of dollars for that and my favorite are the little tiny bananas and y'all ever have little teeny tiny bananas dude they're called timalis in in creole and oh they're just like they're like sugar pops man oh they're so good and we buy all that and and then so some of the most look forward to that then we get into san rafael and saint michelle and then we know we're on the home stretch and as soon as we pull into the compound man if you go with me santa what happens as soon as you get off the truck who is waiting for us yes the cooks and they're picking me up off the ground and i think the reason they're doing that is to kind of see how much food they've got to put in me to get me back to normal the way i was when i left right but they'll pick you up too and Pittsburgh Rob, dude, I'm telling you, each one of those ladies, a couple of them are scrawny, they'll pick you off the ground because, dude, they're cooking in these big cast iron cauldrons. You're like, oh, you know, and they pick you off the ground and it's just so full of love. But if I would have thought that that mountain, that big rock was in the way instead of the way, I would have missed all of that. 
And that's what Peter is going to share with us today as we continue in 1 Peter chapter 2. He's trying to tell the folks, in spite of persecution, in spite of things not going your way, he said, Jesus is the rock that is not in the way. He is the way. And he says, man, there's so many people you're going to encounter where they think he's in the way because he's not doing what they want him to do. You know, he's in the way from them doing it. But he says, man, if he's in the way, you just might as well turn back and, and do nothing. Turn back and go do it. and You'll never experience what God has created you for. Or if you try to find another way, you'll go in circles around the mountain. How many of you ever went in circles trying to find happiness and peace and satisfaction until you gave your life to Christ? Yeah. In so many ways, you go around the mountain, around the mountain, and realize, dude, I just got to go up the mountain. And you know the drivers? Did I, Al, do we know how, where we're going? Do we know how to get there? JJ has a map, right? But how accurate are those maps? They change like hourly, right? <laughs> With floods and rain and stuff. You know, you know who knows how to get us where we're going in Haiti? The driver. You know who knows how to, who to, who, you know who knows how to get us on top of that mountain? Jesus. The Holy Spirit of God is our driver that takes us up there and takes us to Christ. The Holy Spirit will get us where we've got to go in all of that. But if we always think he is in the way of our plans, he's in the way of my dreams, he's in the way of my hopes, he's in the way of what I want to accomplish. Hey, let me ask you a question. Being honest, you pious people, all right? If you're being honest, how many times has Jesus been in your way? Raise your hand if he's ever been in your way. He's ever been in, yeah, he's in the way. But I've got to stay with him, I've got to pray with him, I've got to crucify the flesh until I realize he's not in the way, but he is what? the way so let's take a look and see and check this out so here's what god gave me for y'all before we even like you know i wasn't even thinking about haiti in fact this morning i was praying i was like god give me that opening how i'm supposed to introduce all this and he just reminded me of that mountain range and how if i never went up there and i tried to avoid it or was afraid of it if i thought it was in my way man i'd never experience all the awesome things that there are to experience up there he gave me that for somebody this morning. Maybe it was just me. But for us, Jesus is either the way or he is in the way. Take a look at this. For you, okay, how many of you can say Jesus is the way? For you, Jesus is the way? All right, good. All right, so check these first couple verses out. So Peter's trying to encourage these guys who are under intense persecution. And he says that you ain't seen nothing yet. Persecution just started. You wait. It's getting ready to really ramp up, and it was going to be the most intense persecution that Christians ever experienced in the Roman government. He, he goes on and says, he's trying to encourage them. He says, as you come to him, hey, let me ask you a question. How, how do you come to Christ? He calls you, right? Okay, so you come to him, and when you first come to him, what's that called? What's the S word up there? Salvation. And so many people think that's it. I come to Christ and there's salvation. Okay, so I'm saved. That's all there is. And then I go on with my normal life, and he's like an ace in the hole. He's kind of like a lucky charm. He's, he's something I can pull out whenever I need him. I'm already saved. I'm going to heaven. And you know what? According to Matthew chapter 7, there's going to be a lot of people that at the end who are church people. And, and he's going to be dividing them between the sheep and dividing them into to lines, going to heaven and going to hell. And, and he's going to be putting people in that wrong line they think they're in. He's, and they're going to be, no, no, I'm in the wrong line. Didn't I prophesy in your name? Didn't I do this? And he said, yeah, but you and I never had an intimate relationship. They thought they came to him at salvation, and then they could just go live their regular life after that. You know what? If you stick your finger in an electric socket, Scott, what's going to happen? You stick your finger. Go stick your tongue. There's an electric socket right there. Will you show us, please? Stick your tongue in that electric socket. Uh oh, you're just like gonna play. You're not really gonna do it, man. We got no faith. No, I'm just joking. You got smarts, all right? But yeah, if Chris did it, dude, he'd have a new beard. <laughs> It'd be like, Psh, you know, there's gonna be outward results, lasting results. You think there'd be lasting results if you did stick your tongue in an electric socket? Yeah, and especially if you kept it there. And so again, you plug your life into the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It's not like, oh, I got saved. Now I go off my regular life. So many people kind of have this idea in church and we've created it. You give your life to Christ. Now I got to go live my life. No, when you give your life to Christ, whose does your life belong to, Mac? Him. It's no longer your life. If it's still your life, that means you didn't do what? Yeah, you didn't give it to him if it's still yours. So you got to figure that all out. So when you, it says, as you come to him, 
So it's an ongoing process. You come to him at some certain point in time, and, and it, is, it, is a, it is something you do at a point in time, but in the perfect tense, it means it has everlasting results. So there is a point in time where you come to him and you receive salvation. But you also continue to come to him. How many of y'all came to him this morning? You've been saved. Gary, you got saved. When did you give your life to Christ, Gary? When? Yeah. 1972. Oh, my goodness. I got a picture of me in a Little League outfit in 1972. You gave your life to Christ in 1970. Have you come to him since then? Did you come to him today? Yeah. So when he says, man, when Peter says, as you come to him, you come to him at salvation. But Christy, how often do we come to him? You have kids, right? Yeah. Do they not? Mac, I love it. One night we were out on a, a Bible study out on the island, which as soon as it's below 70 degrees at night, we'll go do again. And, and I remember Mac just, it rolled off his tongue like it was natural. He said, yeah, well, God gave us kids to drive us to our knees. <laughs> it was, I just remember that. He said, yeah, God gives us kids just to drive us to our knees. And, and do your kids drive you to your knees? Do you pray because of things that happen in your life because of your kids? Yeah, you got a mama's heart. So you come to God. He brings things in our life to continually bring us to him. It's not a, we get saved with this one time moment thing. We do. Yeah, I do believe once saved, always saved. If you're really saved. If you're really saved. But dude, if you can just say, oh, I did that and now go live your other life and have a life separate from him. You never got saved. You're, you're, you, you never gave, if he, he didn't own your life now. He never had it. And so as you come to him, you come at salvation, but it's a process. And through that process of sanctification every single day. How many of y'all have had God confront you more than once in a day? <laughs> more than once an hour? Yeah. It's so it's a process. He keeps bringing things into our life, and his purpose is to make us more like him because our job here is to represent him. So he says, as you come to him, you come to him at salvation. You come to him continually through sanctification. You're already saved. You're going to heaven, but he's trying to make you look more like him. And when is it, what's the G word up here, when we actually do look like him, finally, once and for all? Glorification. Man. One day you are going to look just like Christ, not physically. He didn't want us to know what he physically looked like. He wanted us to know what he looked like through his word, through his character. Lucinda, look at your husband right there. Can you believe one day he's going to look just like Christ? Yeah, he's getting there. All of us are getting there. We have our moments, man. How many of y'all are getting there and all of a sudden, dude, you take a nosedive down the cliff? Yep, dude, we have some cliff, cliff dives, man. But guess what? Does that mean we lose our salvation? No. He gets us climbing back up again. And dude, so, but one day at glorification, we're going to look just like him. Hey, Tom Van Giesen, how long are we going to be glorified after that? Sure. Yeah, dude, it's not no more nose dives, no more cliff dives after that. So he says, as you come to him, we come at salvation. We come through sanctification and through glorification. We come to him where we get to live with him for how long, guys? Forever. We get to live with him forever. And so he says, as you, if you want to look at it this way, as you've come to him at salvation and you continue to come to him, he is a living stone. What, when did you, uh, and that's proof of the resurrection. How many of you would say that your lives have been changed by a living God? You have experienced a living God and, and you see the changes happen in your life. Your changed life is proof of a resurrection. And the resurrection is proof that he is God and that he is still living. And so he's a living stone. Hey, by the way, uh, Peter's writing this. And what did Jesus name him? His name was Peter. And he said, no longer will you be called Peter. You'll be called what? Yeah, a stone. Yeah, you're, you're a little rock. So it's funny, Peter's talking to us about being stones, about Christ being a stone and him being a stone. It's kind of a special little thing for Peter, you know. And so he says, as you come to him through salvation, sanctification, glorification, um, something is happening here different today. OK, um, a living stone. He's resurrected. He says he was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. OK, so men reject him. Who rejected Christ? The, the whole Jewish nation did. The, the Jewish leaders, the religious leaders all rejected him. But do people still reject him? Yeah. Why do they reject him? Because they don't believe he is the way. He is what? In the way. And until 
you realize that he is the way, he's going to be in the way. And that's why people reject him. But it doesn't matter because God is not rejecting him. Look at this. He's rejected by men, but so what? Have you guys been rejected by men? Bob, you ever been rejected by men? Yeah, how does that make you feel when you're rejected? Not good at all. But you're accepted by who? And, and dude, and he, when he sees you, he sees the blood of Christ and looks down on you and says, yeah, that's mine. And he sees your future. He sees you look like Christ. That's why he's working so hard to make you look like it for real right here. But if you're accepted by God, that's way better than being accepted by man. It doesn't matter if man rejects you if you're accepted by God. And so Jesus was rejected by man, but in the sight of God, man, he was chosen and precious. Again, who's writing this? Yeah, does, does Terry use the word precious a lot? He does? He's got a little soft side right there, you know? But yeah, Char, does Charlie use the word precious a lot? Oh, he does? Okay, well, Pittsburgh Rob, do you use that word precious a lot? You do. You guys are all blowing my life. Who's really a man man here? Come on, no. Gary! There ain't no precious in your vocabulary. No. Oh, this is a precious mullet, but I'm hooking through the rear end so he'll swim down and get a precious snook. Now, I'm messing with you guys, but you get it? Peter was that rough, tough, old rock'em, sock'em robot fisherman. It was like, in order for something to really be precious, it had to be what? Dude, it had to be precious, man. It's, I mean, for Gary to say precious. Gary, just say it. All right, see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So Peter is saying, dude, Jesus and what he offers, it is, everybody just say it so Gary can just lip it, all right? He is what? Precious, precious. But he's precious and chosen by, by man's standards? No, by God's standards. We live for that audience of one. In fact, Jesus is highly honored because he obeyed God the Father. We read about that in Philippians 2 a couple of weeks ago. But it's God's standard. It doesn't matter what man's standards are. How many of y'all are old enough to see that man's standards have changed? <laughs> if you live past the election, you'll see man's standards are going to change. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm not saying much about all that. I'm just saying, dude, there's crazy junk going on right now. But I don't care because I don't care what happens. I did my job. I did what I could do. But God is in charge of it all, totally in control of whatever. And my job doesn't change. I still get to represent him, you know, and my home is still heaven. And if you're born again, you're in the same boat. So, man, Jesus was he was a he is a living, resurrected, live God living inside of you, able to make changes on a regular basis. He was rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious by God's standards. And those are the standards that you want to be chosen and precious in also. He said, you yourself like, like what kind of stones? So how can you be a living stone? Because you have a living God living in you. He said, you're a living stone. You have eternal life and are being built up. You are being built up. You know, I think sometimes in our Christian walk, we think of, of Christianity as a duty. I don't know. You ever think of it? Oh, I got to go do this. I got to go do this. I did. You know, I got to read my Bible in the morning. Or God, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, is there any time you ever think of? Uh, and I know that's not a good Sunday school answer. No, I do it because I love Jesus, and and everything I do, and that is why we're supposed to do it. But how many of you have ever gone to something religious or you know, some, done something biblical, but you just did it because you're supposed to do it? Anybody? Come on, yeah. Thank Chris. I am so glad you and Scott, you and Scott, you guys are my, are, are, are my illustration people that really are just honest, you know, about stuff, all right? I'm going to ask you some questions that you're going to really think before you raise your hand, because I got you trained now. <laughs> Scott, will you buy your what? No, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, we think of it sometimes as duty, but you know what? Being a Christian is not duty, it's privilege. Do you understand the privilege of having a living God inside of you? He said, man... You yourselves are like living stones. You have eternal life. You're being built up, built up. Do you see that? He says, he says, you're being built up. Each of you are being built up as living stones and the stones are building up. It's privilege to be part of God's family. And he said, it's being built as a spiritual house. Where's the spiritual house? Who is the spiritual house that you're all being a part of? The church. But is it this church? Oh, no, wait, it's the church down there. It's the church back home, right? 
maybe you've never met, neighbor you, you've never even seen before. Is it an encouragement to see spiritual stones? And can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven? Can you imagine, Pittsburgh Rock, can you imagine what it's going to be like in heaven to see all the believers that we know? Yeah, it's going to be phenomenal. And we're all going to be going, dude, look at Jesus. All this. And he said, here's your purpose. He said, as a spiritual house, the church, to be whole, a holy priesthood. Hey, what do priests do? What do they do? Okay, they minister on his behalf. They, that minister means they serve whoever they're ministering for and serve the people they're ministering to. They what? They uh, perform the sacrifice. Uh, okay, we're going to talk about the sacrifice there. But who, do they, who does a priest represent? God. God. They represent God. And so he says, you guys are a holy representation of God. That's who, that's who God has left you here to be, to be. Hey, so could you look in the mirror right now and say, I am a holy representation of God. Ooh, what if we did look at ourselves in the mirror and asked ourselves that? And we saw our identity. Instead, you know where we get our identities from a lot of times? From Facebook, from Instagram, from our neighbors, from our conversations, from TV. They tell us who we are. Doing. You know where our identity needs to come from? It comes from Christ and it comes from the word. Look at this. What if you did put on your mirror and, and every day you saw that I am a holy representation of God? You know, you want to get a tattoo? Get a tattoo right there, man. Or get a tattoo on your forehead and have a mirror. I am a holy. You have to do it backwards to see it in the mirror, though. Boy, that would freak some people out, wouldn't it? <laughs> Dude, you got a whole head that would be able to do all that, man. Yeah, a holy, I am a holy representation of God. What if we had that before us? I mean, through whatever, I'm a holy representation of God. That's what he says you are. That's your potential. That's what he wants you to be. That's what he's empowering you to be. When you see that the rock is not in the way, but it is what? The way. The way. You get up on that mountain and one of the things you see Man, you see that you're part of the spiritual house with a bunch of other people walking with Christ because he'll make you have encounters. You'll see that, dude, I represent him. How many of you have ever represented him and said, dude, that was the worst thing in my life? How many of you ever like really represented him and it's like, wow, that's pretty awesome. How many of you ever had him do something so supernatural in your life that you can't explain it any other way? You know, is that not awesome? That is an awesome thing. That's what happens on the rock when you see the rock is the way and not in the way. And so he said, you're a holy priesthood. And your purpose, John, here, as you were saying, is to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 1 and 2. But I beseech you, Paul says, I beg you, because God has been so merciful to you that you present your what? Your bodies a living sacrifice. Dude, a sacrifice usually gets killed, right? But he wants to be a living sacrifice, living for him. He said that's holy and acceptable to God. And you do it through the renewing of your what, Charlie? Mind. Your mind, exactly. And I went picking on Charlie because his head was down. And he looked like he was sleeping and drooling. There's a puddle on the floor right there. But I was picking on because that's a conversation we have all the time. How long have we been working on renewing minds, man? Over and when are we going to quit? We're never going to quit until that mind's renewed from, the, from reading the word of God. And so he, here's what Peter's saying, the same thing, man. You're a holy priesthood, representation of God, and you offer spiritual sacrifices. You're not, does God want you to go slay a bull? Especially not if you own, don't own it. <laughs> don't, please don't go do that. My son's a rancher, all right? They would not appreciate that. They paid big money for that bull. But God doesn't want your goats, your chickens, your whatever. What does God want according to this? He wants us. He wants to say, Chris, I want you to step out of your comfort zone and go do this. And you say, absolutely, because I belong to you and I'll do it. Hey, but let me ask you a question, a sacrifice. Terry, we make a sacrifice. You make a sacrifice. What you give, technically with the term sacrifice, what you give is not usually, it's usually more than what, than what you get back, right? That's a sacrifice. Can we ever really give God more than what we've already got from him? So he calls it a sacrifice, but you understand it's really not. There's no way we could ever give more than what we're getting back in it, but he just says that's the way they can ex describe it here for us. A spiritual sacrifice is simply, man, making your body a living sacrifice so every step you take is for who? It's for him. 
He said, and that's what happens. But when do we not take, become a living sacrifice? When we see him in the way, right? As opposed to the way. So next time you're being confronted with something and he says, yeah, that's what I want you to do. And you're like, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do that. A any of y'all ever do that? Any of you ever say that? Being honest? Bob, God says, I want you to do this. And you're like, no, I don't want to do it. We're all there at some point because we're not perfect. But the fact is, is that living sacrifice says, all right, I see you in the way of my life right now, but I'm trusting you because you know everything, you can do anything, and you're everywhere, and I'm going to do it your way. And then once you get up there, you find out, wow, this really is the way. What I thought was in the way, it's not. He really is the way. And so he says, man, offer yourself as a spiritual sacrifice acceptable to God, and it can only be done through Jesus. Uh, once you give your life to Christ, now you have him living inside of you, and now he guides and he directs you in all of this. He goes on and says, for it stands in Scripture, uh, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone. And by the way, what, what's different about their construction than ours? When we have construction, what do we do? We bring all the materials on site, right? And then what happens? You're, you're in construction, right? Uh, you, you all the materials are on site, right? And then you start building. Do you ever have to, like, you're an electrician, right? Do you ever have to change what you were going to do? All the time right now. Yeah, if Zane was here, he would tell you even names for all of that. Where you come on the site and you start building, you have to change. You know what? When they built, they built it all off-site. It was like prefab. And it was done with giant blocks of marble and whatever. And they custom engineered and designed it. And then they brought it all to the site and it all fit perfect. Could you imagine being on a site like that? You can't even imagine, can you? Yeah, because we are so far from that. And, and so that cornerstone, when they set that cornerstone, man, that had to be perfect because if the cornerstone was off, what? Everything was off. It set all the angles, all the measurements, everything. And, 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 and there it was. And so spiritually, the cornerstone is the cornerstone that connects Judaism, two walls, Judaism and Christianity. And it perfectly brings them together under Christ looking forward to a Messiah and looking back to a Messiah. And so it sets everything. So when we build, it's got to be built according to the way God wants it built or it doesn't work. So he goes on and says, a cornerstone set uh, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So somebody who has a Bible, like a paper Bible with them, anybody have a paper, paper Bible and you want to read? You want to read? All right, good. Go to Matthew 7, and it's 24, 25, 26, 27. Sophie, she's already done this once. She fell for it once, and she's not doing it again, right? Because yeah. I'm going to interrupt you every single line. But Matthew 7, 24, and uh, you guys can turn there. I didn't, I didn't write it down. Destiny, you got it too? All right, good, good, good. Are, are you there yet? Yeah. All right, you there? Go ahead. Matthew 7. Now, you got to read loud. you got to come out of your comfort zone. Here is a living sacrifice for you. you got to, in fact, stand up. Go ahead and just stand up. Read, read that first one. <clears throat> This is a total living sacrifice for this shy girl right here, man. Uh, thank you. Go ahead. Your parents will buy you Joy's ice cream for doing this, but God will reward you much better. First verse. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Okay, 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 stop. So he goes on and he says, and, and if you read the rest of Matthew chapter 7, it's all about what I just told you about dividing people in lines. It's, it's about a lot of different things. And uh, that are hard sayings that Jesus given, but he says, if you put into practice the sayings of mine, he didn't say if you hear them, he didn't say if you could recite them, you could quote them back. He said, if you put into pr practice the sayings of mine, here he's saying, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So here he's saying, uh, Jesus is saying, you put these things, these sayings of mine into practice, you actually do them. Go ahead. Yeah, the next part, yeah. The rain came down, the trees withered, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Okay, all right, all right so time out. So you, 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 you put the saying, uh, did you miss something in there? Did we? Uh, okay, so we, we put the sayings into practice, and then, he, and we're building a house, right? Or did we even get to a house? Yeah, we did. All right, start over again. Start with the first one again, man. I must have missed something here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house. Oh, yeah, I forgot that part. He's like a wise man that built his house on a rock, okay? All right, so not on the sand. You could build a beautiful, you see that big mansion that's down there? What's that called? Is there a name for that mansion? What's that? 
the Eustace Mansion. Can you imagine if they built that right on the beach right here? Uh, the day we were baptizing you, what would have happened to that mansion, bro? It had been gone, right? But he says, if you take my sayings and put them into practice, it's like building a house on a, on a rock, right? Is that what you said? Okay, go on to the next part. The rain fell down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Okay, so he does say, you know what? A lot of modern theology says, okay, so you build your life on his principles. You do what he says to do. There'll be no more storms. There'll be no wind. There'll be no rain. There'll be no tough times. You give your life to Jesus. Everything's awesome. It is awesome internally, but how many of you have given your life to Jesus and there were some external challenges? <laughs> how many of you ever had storms come? In fact, some, there used to be a saying that if you haven't met the devil, you're probably going his way, you know? There, there's a lot of, in fact, the way God strengthens us is through suffering and through tough times. So he says, even when you put your life into practice, you put those principles in practice, like building a house on the rock. But he said, the storm comes, the wind's going to blow, everything's going to, the tide's going to come all the way in, the waves are going to crash in. But what happens? It did not fall. Okay. But then the next part, go ahead. Yeah. So he said, if you hear, go ahead, sit down. Thank you. Give her a hand because that Woo! is like, yeah. All right. So I want you to know you just had some external praise. So there will be no eternal rewards. You just got what you're getting. No, I'm joking right now. I'm messing with you. But, but literally, you know the story, guys. He said, if you take my sayings and you put them into practice, it's like building a house on a rock. The storms are going to come. How many of you would say in your Christian life, storms have come? Dude, they're there, and you might be in the middle of one. But if you're building it on his principles, he says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. He's not going to let it crumble, not going to let it get washed out to sea. He said it's going to stand as a testimony to his faithfulness, not even yours. But if you don't put him into practice, it's like building this beautiful exterior mansion, this beautiful mansion, beautiful house, but you didn't build it on a foundation. And when those storms come, it's gone. So, man, he's saying, look, next time you think that he is in the way. Next time, man, you got a decision to make. Next time you got something in your family going on, and something in your business going on, something and you're like, he's in the way. I can't do it his way. Have you ever come into the society and you've been faced, especially with a business decision? You don't understand my business. You don't understand my industry. You don't understand. I can't do it his way. Anybody ever felt that way? Well, I'll get fired. I do that. This will happen. This will happen. I can't. You know what? The industry doesn't work this way. We have to violate scripture. You never have to violate scripture. When is it right to do the wrong thing? Never. That's what the world wants us to believe. God says, no, dude, build it on me and watch me make it work in such a supernatural way that only I get blamed for it. But most of us don't have the guts to do it that way, including me. We compromise. He says, man, whoever puts their faith and trust in me will not be put to shame. You won't be put to shame. In fact, that word believe, it's the word John used like 99 times in the Gospel of John. It's the word pistua in the Greek. And it literally means to lean on a crutch. That's what it means, to lean on a crutch. How much of my weight is on this right now? All of it. So if Karen, go ahead and kick it out from under me. No. No. Sophie, you want to kick it out? You do. I, oh, Terry, sit down. No. <laughs> if you kicked it out, I'm down. And that's what he says, man. Whoever puts all their weight, all their faith, all their trust in me, you will not be put to shame. But you notice what happened? I saw the adversity come out. Oh, no, I'm going to do it a different way. Terry was the adversity. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm, I got it. But, dude, wouldn't that have been awesome if I would have been here and Terry kicked it out and I actually stayed? <laughs> I'm not saying that was going to happen. We're not going to try But wouldn't that have been awesome? That's what he wants to do. He wants to let the world kick your system out from under you and watch you succeed. So who gets the glory? He does. He, you will not be put to shame. That's his promise. And you encourage others with that to live for him because they will not be put to shame. That's the way to encourage people. So for us, you know what? Jesus is, is the way. But for others, Jesus is what? He's in the way. And sometimes for us, he's in the way also. Look at this. 
He said, so the honor is for you who believe. And again, there's that leaning on a crutch. The honor is for you that believe. Hey, what does the world say about leaning on a crutch? Oh, you Christians just need a what? <laughs> you guys just need a crutch. You know what? Yes, I do. <laughs> That's awesome. That's not a cut to me. Yeah, I need a crutch. And my crutch is Christ. It's okay. So he says the honor is for you who believe. The honor is for you who lean on that crutch. Because you're crippled and the only way you're making it through is with Christ. But he says for those who do not believe. Those that say, I, I'm not leaning on that crutch. I'm not doing that. You know what he says? For those that won't believe, hey, if they're not leaning on Christ, what are they leaning on? Something else. Man, what better thing can we lean on than Christ? Everything else is going to let us down. At some point, things change. Economies change. Businesses change. Systems change. People change. It's like, so everybody's leaning on something. And Peter's saying, don't stop leaning on Christ. You'll not be let down. The people who lean on anything but Christ, they will be let down. And I don't know what kind of decisions you've got going on in life right now, but if there's no other point you get, man, lean on Christ. Realize he is not in the way. He is what? The way. The way. And you aren't going to experience the things on that mountaintop until you get up there. And you don't even have to get up there. You just have to submit. The Holy Spirit's the driver of your little tap tap, right, Al? He's a little driver. He's taking you up there. If I had to depend on Al to get in there and drive, we'd never get where we're going. Man, we, I need the Holy Spirit driving us up there. So he says, man, he said, to on, the honor is for you who believe. The honor is for you that are leaning on God as your crutch. But for those who do not believe, they're leaning on anything other than Christ. And it says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So God has already picked Christ to be the way. He's the guy everything's built on. And he said, it's going to be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. How many people are offended by Christianity today? Hey, do you think anybody, Charlie? Yeah, you can talk about God. I want to challenge you to do this. Next time you're talking about God, talk about God. Talk about God. Say things about God. But I dare you to mention the name of Jesus. Substitute the name of Jesus for God and watch the opposition happen. That's often we'll be talking about, well, God did this. God's allowed, you know, start using the name Jesus and see what people do. It name is offensive. It is. There's people vehemently against that at this point in time. That name, because he's exclusive. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can get to the father except through me. That name Jesus, man, it, it's hard for people to swallow. And, and, and you may be saying, no, no, just try it. You can talk about God all you want because Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, any kind of people can put God in there. You know, the 12-step program. There's got to be a God, somebody higher than us, so God can be whoever I want it to be. But you get it exclusive as Jesus and see what happens. But let me ask you a question. Who is the only way, the truth, the life? Jesus, period, not God. Because God can mean so many different things. God's a generic term for blue. She has a blue shirt on. Does that mean, Nikki, your shirt's not blue? And your little thing under you is not blue, and your shirt's not blue. No, because they're not the same, right? But they're all blue. God can mean a lot of things. Jesus means one thing, and Jesus is our Savior. So he said, man, it's a stone of stumbling. He's in the way for people. No, this is the way we do it. We rip people off. This is the way we do it. We do it through politics. This is the way we do it. We do it with force and with violence. This is the way we do it. We do it through, you know, whatever system there is. But Jesus is the only way. So he's had a stone of stumbling and, and a rock of offense. For many, he is in the way. They stumble because they what? Disobey. And what do they disobey? His word. If you obey his word, you do what he says to do. If you disobey his word, you've picked and Even Christians, we pick and choose sometimes. I, I, I can't do this. It's not, I can't do it this way. It, won't, it will work. But they disobey what he said to do. And it says, as they were destined to do. Now, they're not destined for unbelief. God didn't pick people to be like, oh, they're going to be an unbeliever. He knows they're, they're going to be an unbeliever. People who are unbelievers are destined for eternal judgment in hell. And we can get into that another day. But the fact is, is for some people, his word, what he says to do, is a stumbling block. It is in the way. He said, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you've not received mercy, but now... 
you're going to you receive mercy he's talking about us and what is mercy mercy is not getting what what you deserve what do you deserve mac dude you're a pretty nice guy holly what does mac deserve you love hot he's a great guy what is what does mac deserve no okay mac what is hot i love you you treasure you honor you love your wife you respect your wife but what does she deserve well, I was going to say something close. She really deserves eternity in hell, <laughs> which till death do us part. But, but listen, is that not what we deserve by our sin? We deserve eternity in hell. Someone as sweet as Holly and you love her and cherish her and honor and want to probably punch me out for saying that. But the fact is, she deserves you. That might be eternity in hell for her till death do us part. But, but literally, we all deserve eternity in hell. That's why we can say when somebody says, how you doing? What do we say back to them? Better than I deserve. And boy, that'll be a great co gospel conversation starter. Well, no, you're not. No, dude, I start the gospel so many times with that. How you doing? Well, better than I deserve. Because I deserve because I have sinned. How many of you have, have never sinned? Anybody here never sinned? Please raise your hand so you will sin and be a liar. Seriously, you have sinned. And when we sin one time, we have earned a free trip to hell. And nobody wants that free trip to hell. God has made a way to give us a free trip to heaven by putting our faith and trust in him. And so we deserve, he says, that mercy is not getting what we deserve. He said, you guys used to, you were on track to get what you deserved. You had a free trip to hell. He said, but now you've received mercy. You're not getting what you deserve. In fact, you get grace and grace is, is getting more than you deserve, which is to be his child. So the deal is this, that for us, for us, it, he is the way. For others, he is in the way. So, for, so show those that think he's in the way that Jesus is the way. That's our purpose here. But if he's always in our way, how successful are we going to be at showing him that he's not in the way? If he's always in our way. It doesn't matter what it is. Do it his way in this. So he goes on and says, but you're a chosen. Hey, what's this word? What's the next word? We're a chosen what? Who is we? Who's a chosen race? Christians. Hey, so let me ask you a question. How many races are there in the Bible? What is the world using to try to divide all of us by right now? And I'm just going to speak blank about it. Yes, I appreciate your African-American culture if you have that. I appreciate our Polak culture, right? We eat galunkies and cabbage, and we have a Polish culture. Anybody else here Polish? Dude, yeah, dude. Oh, Destiny Gortowski. Yeah, dude, I forgot. We got a bunch of skis in here, right? But more important than us being Polish, we're what? We're believers. More important than me being an African-American, I'm a what? I'm a believer, more important than being an Italian-American. Isn't that what y'all De La Barraras are back there? Oh, no. What are you guys? Oh, Cuban. Dude, why does it sound so Italian, man? All right. So more important than being Cuban. Why? You're a believer. More important than any race card you want to pick. The world's using that to divide us all. But when you've given your faith and your trust to Jesus Christ, look what he says. You are a chosen what? Race. And again, I know that's not popular. I know that that's, pl I'll, we'll probably get face, uh, I won't even say it because then they'll, they'll find, oh, wait, 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 wait we'll, we'll get censored on this or whatever. They probably won't, but, but the fact is, is Bible says, once you be, in fact, he even said, you're no longer Jew. You're no longer Greek. You've seen Paul say that over and over again. He said, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew, you're a Greek or you're whatever. What matters is you're born again, you're a believer. And there is no beating around the bush on here. You're a chosen, born again race. And it's talking about an ethnicity. That's what that word race means. There's no two ways about it. He said, you're a chosen race. You become a believer, dude. Who do you have access to? No matter what color your skin is. Hey, how about, how about the folks with dark skin in Haiti, Emily? Do they have the same access to God as you with your little white skin or tan skin? How about the girls don't go get no sun up in Boston or wherever? They have the same access to, uh, access to them? Yeah, we have access through Christ. That's our new race right there, folks. He says, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood. And a priest represents who? God. God. And if you're royal, he's in charge. So, so you are a royal priesthood. You represent, you represent the king. 
And, and I, I put something in here. You serve the king by access to his presence. You go in front of the king and say, king, what do you want me to do? You know, kind of like you do with your mom and dad, right? What do you want me to do, sire, today? And they're like, oh, I want you to wash the car and pick up all the dog poop out of the front yard. And, and so you're like, yes. And then so you now say, all right, girls, come help me. The king has now said, and I represent the king, that we all have to pick dog poop up in the front yard, right? I know that's not how it works, but you have a chance to change the situ- uh, system right now. But literally, that's it. We have access to the king. And we find out what the king wants us to do. And then we go do it. And we bring other people in to do that. But if we don't have access, if we don't access ourselves, if we don't spend time with him, then do you really know what the king wants you to do? So as Emily, was, as these guys were all saying about prayer, Ashley was mentioned about prayer. You guys mentioned about prayer. You got to spend time with the king. To know what he wants you to do. Otherwise you really just don't. So he says you're a chosen race. A royal priesthood. Serve the king by access to his presence. The most important thing you do. On a daily basis. Is get in his presence. He says you're a holy nation. There's that word race again. Almost the exact same word. You're, you're a holy ethnos. You're a holy, a, a holy country. Nation. A group of people. A people for his own possession. In the King James it calls you a peculiar person. Did anybody remember in, in Sunday school, did anybody grow up with that translation where they said you were a peculiar person? And you know what? When I heard that back in the day, Tom, I, I thought, you know, what that, you know how they preached it back then? That means you got to dress like a dork. That means you got to act like, you, you, that means you got to be 20 years behind modern culture you know, in your external appearance because you're peculiar. They have to know you're different. But is he talking about us being different on the outside or inside? On the inside. You're very different there. And it literally means you're his own possession. That's what peculiar means. And peculiar means encompassed. God's like a basketball or soccer ball, for those of you who like soccer. He's a, he's a ball, and you're right in the middle of it. So, Mac, anything that's coming into you has to do what? If, you're, if he's a ball and you're in the middle of the ball, anything coming into your life's what? It, it's it's got to go through him. It's got to go through him. So think about that this week. Think about that every single week. Anything coming in your life, it's, got, it's gone through him. Figure out what he wants you to do with all of that because he's not letting anything in unless he's got a purpose in that. Moving on, he said, and here's your purpose. So here's your purpose. It said that you may proclaim, and this word proclaim means to advertise. That's your job. You advertise the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Did you know that? You guys are all into marketing. That's your job. You're a marketer. You're into marketing. You're an advertising agent. Gary, you're an advertising agent for the king. Amen. So when they see you, who should you be advertising? The king. The king. You, should be, you should be talking about the glorious things, how he's taken you out of darkness and brought you into marvelous light. You are his advertisement. Man, you know... I wonder if we were to take a picture of our lives and we, I wonder how much our life would really represent him in our advertisement. What do we advertise? That might be something to ask the Holy Spirit. What do we advertise? We should be advertising him in all of that. So he says, you're a chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation of people for his own possession that you may proclaim or advertise the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into the marvelous light. That's the purpose of why you're here. You got one purpose, Chris, and that is it's not to build bridges, although that's where he's got you. You're one purpose, Sabrina, and it's not to actually run a warehouse in it for Amazon, although that's what you, where you've got you. One purpose, not just to be a nurse, right? Not one purpose, not just be a nanny, right? Or to sell boats or close deals on boats, right? Right? One purpose. What is your one purpose? Advertise. Advertise. Whatever he's got you doing, you should be an advertisement for Christ. And so that's something we can check ourselves with in there. And he says, did I just, I might have missed something. Okay, so he goes on and says, so the honor is for you who believe. Lean on a crutch. I missed something here. Uh, I urge you, so let's just start with verse 11. He says, beloved, I urge you as sojourners. And that word is alien. Hey, do you know you're an alien? You are an alien. Hey, will you, so uh, tell your sister she's an alien. 
You're an alien. And, and God, tell, tell her she's an alien. Yeah, that doesn't mean from another planet. It means you're from another world. Have you given your life to Christ? Then you're an alien. You, you, an alien is from another way, another world, right? Is this your world? No, where's your world? Heaven. Yeah, you're just not there right now. Isn't that what happens? How many of y'all ever seen UFOs? Come on, man. No, I'm just messing with you. I believe Bigfoots, all right? But no, I'm just joking. But, but literally, an alien is somebody who came from another planet, right? They're not in their planet. They're not in the world that they really live in. That's at least, you know, if you, if you believe all that stuff, whatever. But we're an alien. We have our home in heaven, our citizenship. That's our planet. This is not it. We are here to represent our planet. I'm here to represent my planet. <laughs> All right. Warning, Will Rogers. Warning. Do you guys remember Will Rogers? Just lost in space. That's where we're from, man. Not Star Wars and all that. But all right. He said, I urge you guys as aliens, as exiles, you're not a citizen here, to abstain from passions of the flesh, things that are causing you to quench the Holy Spirit in your life, things that are getting in between you and God because you're living right here in this. He said they wage war against your soul. He says, man, please don't do that because what you're doing when, when you get more involved in, the, in, in this planet than the one where you're from, when you get more involved in this world than the one you're from, he says you have a hard time advertising for the planet that you're from. But this would be a good week to be careful with that. He says, man, and you wage his war against your soul. You get messed up. You forget your identity and everything else. He said, keep your conduct among Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers. So they're going to speak. How many of y'all know that people think that things we think are right or wrong? Okay. I'm just going to say, uh, Judy and Charlie, you believe abortion's wrong? Uh, uh, definitely. You believe abortion's wrong in that? Okay. And, and, and uh, yeah, yeah. Killing babies is wrong again. I'm not talking about a political thing. I'm talking about anything, but abortion's wrong. But there are many people who believe it's okay who don't have Christ. Uh, okay. And there's things that Christianity believes that, that the world doesn't. They, so Daniel, when Daniel, they wanted to bust Daniel for being, for being messed up. What did they have to make illegal to be able to bust Daniel? Prayer. prayer. Yeah, king, we need to put him away, man. So let's make prayer illegal. And so he prayed, and they're like, did you pray? Yep, okay, you're going in the lion's den. So this is what it's kind of saying is that he said, don't do the wrong thing so that even when they speak wrong, it means they had to make right thing wrong. They had to make the right thing wrong. And he says, but at least later they'll be like, what do they have to say about Daniel? Oh, we caught Daniel doing what? We caught Daniel praying. We caught him praying. Can you believe he was praying? And it was like, and all the people who made evil wrong were like, yeah, throw them in the lion's den. So make them catch you doing what God wants you to do, even if they now make it illegal and it's wrong. That's what he's saying here. So if they see your good deeds, even if they disagree with them, when they said Daniel got caught praying, Daniel was praying, who did it indirectly give glory to? God. So if you're doing the right thing, even if they make it the wrong thing, but it's God's thing, God even gets the glory. So when they accuse you of it, it brings God glory. He said, make that happen so that in the day of visitation, so that in the day when God visits them, when the day, God, those people that are making fun of you, those people that are beating you down for your walk with Christ, those people that are giving you a hard time, you know what? One day God's going to visit them. One day the Holy Spirit is going to say, you know what? You need a change in your life and you need to meet me. And they're going to need to go to somebody to hear about God. Who are they going to go to? Especially if they've been watching you. Who are they going to go to? They're going to go to you. You keep your testimony faithful so that when they have a visitation by God, when the Holy Spirit comes to them, that then they will come to you. But if they see you wishy-washy, they see you compromising, they see you being a hypocrite, are they coming to you? No. They want to see somebody who really believes what they say they believe in and live in it. All right. So for you, Jesus is what? For others, Jesus is? And so here's your purpose. Show those that think Jesus is that Jesus is the way. And that's all I got to say about that today. Let's pray. Father, I... I don't know what sticks out to anybody in any of this. Um, Father, I know what you had to stick out to me.
Father, I know this is a piece of scripture. I, I know that even when I first even started looking at it, um, you showed me that you were this giant rock and you were either the foundation we were going to build our life on or you were going to be the frustration that we try to build our life around. Um, then you showed me this, that you're either the way or you're in the way. So, Father, I pray that if there's somebody here that has come up against this giant mountain range in their life, and um, you're not the way, but you just seem to be in the way, and maybe they want to quit for whatever reason. Maybe they want to go around the mountain again for some other reason, thinking there's another way. Father, I pray you give them a desire and ability to surrender themselves to you and just say, you are the way. It doesn't make sense, but man, I'm going. I'm going to let your Holy Spirit drive me to you and do whatever it is you want me to do. And I believe that whatever you ask me to do, you'll give me the power and ability to do because you're a living God. I'm going to surrender, and, and, and I believe you are the way and not in the way. So, Father, if someone's never established that, I pray today be the day. Pray they don't waste their time driving around the mountain again. Those are dangerous mountains, man. And if they die before they get around, before they get up the mountain, there's problems. So, Father, I pray you'd give someone a new home in heaven today because they'd realize you are the way. But, Father, I got a feeling you're speaking to us as Christians today. And I pray that you would reveal to us areas of our life where even those of us who feel like we have surrendered everything, where your Holy Spirit would reveal to us where we really believe you are in the way, where a compromise is necessary, where maybe going to the next level isn't necessary. Father, I don't know. I just feel really strong that you want to speak to someone today. And I know you're speaking to me. Show me areas of my life where you are in the way. And Father, give me the guts to accept your grace to realize you are the way. No matter how much sense it doesn't make, I pray will you just do it your way. So Father, um, I pray that as we surrender and we see it from your perspective, we can help others. Father, I can't wait for each person here to meet somebody this week, maybe even today, who feels that Jesus is in the way and you're preparing them for salvation and we can share this with them. So uh, help us to be mindful all week that you are not in the way, but you are the way. And use it however you decide to use it. And I can't wait to hear how you do that. And I pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing and let's worship together.
Hey, so Al, more than the food, my favorite part of being on top of the mountain in Haiti that I would never find anywhere else is the fellowship with other believers. Man, if you ever go with us, how many of you ever been in a Haitian mosh pit before? Dude, we have a Haitian worship mosh pit that is just phenomenal. You will be speak, you'll be worshiping in Creole with brothers and sisters, and it, it is just the presence of God, and it's an awesome thing. And so I challenge you to pray. Make that your prayer this week. Say, God, show me every way where I think you are in the way. And show me every way that I think you're in my way. And give me the desire to believe that you are the way. And do it your way, no matter what it looks like. So I want to encourage you to do that today. Because you'll have experience with him that I don't think you can have any other way until you get up there. Until the Holy Spirit brings you there. Uh, hey, so like to hang out with you this week, Bible study tomorrow night. If y'all want to do something tomorrow, the weather's good, give me a shout, yell at me, but I know Tuesday we're going paddle boarding and I need you to give me a shout and let me know that you want me to reserve paddle board for you, nine to noon type thing. Tuesday night, Tom Van Giesen, you've got a Bible study right here, right? At 6.30. Uh, Wednesday uh, morning, we're actually going out on the boat Wednesday morning and then Wednesday evening, we've got a Bible study at Taryn Fernandez's house. A uh, couple's Bible study up there, and uh, that's on North Beach, um, Thursday morning. I'd love to go out on the boat again. If anybody wants to go on the boat or paddleboard, you just let me know. Skip your job. Shut your business down just for a day, man, you know? Just come on out. And, uh, and then Thursday night, Captain Mac, you're still on a hiatus. Furlough right now because I'm going to be having surgery. So okay. Furlough, that's a 2020 word, right? Yeah, for a furlough. Okay, and, uh, and so no Bible study Thursday night. Friday night, Zane will be having at his house. Uh, again, I am open Thursday, Friday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Do whatever you guys want to do. I'd love to go play. Saturday, Emily, you've got a Bible study uh, down at the coffee house down here. You can see her on that. And then we'll see you again on Sunday. So I love you guys, but not as much as Jesus loves you. All right, have a great week.